Hello and welcome back to the Life on the Wrist YouTube channel. Today we're going to be doing what we've done for the last couple of years. Actually, I think we've done it every single year that we have uh, been doing Life on the Wrist, and that is reflecting on the year. Uh, we'll be looking back at some of our favorite pieces that we've been able to cover on the uh, channel as well as our website uh, from the past 12 months. And so um, it's always a fun thing to do, and, I, and I'm very excited to jump into this year because I do think that we had some very interesting pieces with really interesting histories that we were hopefully able to educate you on. So, without further ado, let's get into it. So, it's always great to take a moment and sort of reflect on the last 12 months when it comes to um, watch collecting. Um, I think it's a we have the unique opportunity to really see and feel and interact with many different pieces um, and it's been honestly a great pleasure over the last um, several years to be able to hopefully educate you on some of these incredible pieces that we've had the opportunity to, to interact with. It's also been an incredible journey for us as we can experience, I mean I, I have the opportunity to experience so many different watches and so much variety that they present. Especially when it comes to vintage watches, there's so much that for you to learn, and every piece that you have the opportunity to interact with, you can really take a lot away from, from that one piece, whether it is about learning about the case manufacturers for a brand, or how the brand did business in different markets. There's also watches that have incredible um, inscriptions on their case backs that are really fun to research and allow you to learn something about maybe someone else's life that you didn't know about or perhaps um, will never know about but there is something that that watch holds for that person and now it will hold for you. A great example is actually this um, Omega Chronograph Reference um, 2379. Uh, it was manufactured in the 1950s, but there's a really beautiful inscription on the back from 1953 that um, it, was a, it was a gift um, in 1953. And while I don't know the individual who gifted this watch, I don't know the individual who received the watch uh, and, and personally wore it, um, I was able to kind of learn a little bit about a part of their life that maybe um, was very significant to them. So um, I've spoken a lot here. Uh, I think what, what I can do is maybe go into some of the pieces that we've covered over the last 12 months. Um, and if you see me looking down, it's just because I have my laptop in front of me so I can kind of speak through each of the pieces. The first one that I wanted to go through was actually a, wa uh, a pocket watch that we covered in February and that was a 1920s Patek Philippe pocket watch. The reason why I really, I mean, this, this watch is like everything that I really love about um, Patek Philippe, I, I love about watch collecting. Um, the overall design of the watch is very, very appealing to me. It has these really incredible, large um, Arabic or Breguet numerals. It also has uh, leaf hands, which is something that I absolutely have fallen in love with over the last several years of me being a collector and um, it's from a brand that needs no introduction, needs no explanation because they really are the top of the top when it comes to um, watch manufacturing. Uh, it was in fairly good condition, there was some really nice oxidation on, on the case back of the watch which I thought was really unique and if you know me I really love um, oxidation like that. So the reason why this is one of the pieces has to do with obviously the importance of um, Patek Philippe in the, in the grand scheme of watchmaking the aesthetics really spoke to me in, in an incredible way. Um, and I also think that I've covered pocket watches extensively on Life on the Wrist, and I do think that there is some value in them that collectors are not seeing. Um, I think they're slowly starting to get a little bit more popularity, and pieces like this are a phenomenal example of what um, collectors likely will love. And um, it was so fun to interact with this specific piece. The next piece that I, that I really enjoyed, and I think this was kind of a theme for this year um, when it came to vintage watch collecting, was a 1961 Gigi de Coultre in steel. Um, obviously GLC has produced many watches, diverse pieces um, that run the gamut when it comes to design and um, innovation. They produce watches, they produce movements for brands like Patek Philippe, Ormand Pelier, Vacherol, Constantin, IWC. And so, um, their story is very well known. But this year, there really was a trend towards uh, very simplistic JLC pieces, specifically 
steel cased pieces with very simple white dials. The piece that we had the opportunity to interact with was from 1961, and it was a 33 millimeter cased piece with a white dial and these gold applied hour, mar hour markers that matched the gold sword hands. The simplicity of this watch really spoke to many collectors. Uh, I had so many people reaching out to me about this specific piece. Um, and uh, it really, I think, symbolized a good, a really nice trend towards simplistic vintage watches, um, but of a very high extreme quality. The dial was, had a really nice creamy tone to it. The gold applied hour markers were in fairly good condition and showed a little bit of age. Um, the watch was running on the K478-C manual line movement, which was developed from the caliber 470. It's basically a manual line movement that was originally used in the military 7A watches and was, um, it really was a, a, an incredible, um, incredible movement as well. It also was identical to the caliber 479, which was used in J the JLC Mark, Mark, uh, Mark 10's pilot watches that were delivered to the British RAF in 1945 except the 479 had these uh, subsidiary seconds, which made it a little bit different. There also was a really beautiful inscription on the back, which spoke to me quite highly. Um, it said, 1961, D. Tracy, over 40 years with C.S. Milner and Co. It likely points to um, the sale and gifting of this piece from a company to an individual named D. Tracy um, for many years of service. This isn't something that's done very often now, and um, it's uh, it's a good reminder of, of what uh, companies can do for their employees and how um, companies can value the people that they work for. It's also really important to think about all the things that that individual saw over the 40 years of service that they had to that company. So I'll leave a link in the description of this video so you can read our article uh, about that piece. The next one, the next watch, uh, my second to last pick is from 1954. It's a 1954 Longines Barlow Reference 700. Um, Longines is a brand that I've covered extensively on Life on the Wrist. I think it presents so much value to collectors. And um, during, it, sort of in the vintage era of watchmaking, Longines was competing against many of the top brands. And I'd say competing heavily against brands like Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet. Um, they produced um, really interesting pieces, interesting case designs, and what was really nice to see is in the U.S. market, they continued that sort of trend. The Longines Barlow Reference 700 that we had in was sold in the USA market by the Longines Whitnauer Group, um, and uh, it had such a unique case shape, which is what really spoke to me. Uh, if you look at the watch, it has these really interesting sort of case, um, these case details that it wasn't specific to the lugs, but it was kind of on the corners of the outside of the case, and it gave the watch just a different dimension, and it was something that you can wear on your wrist, and you can feel you feel like you're having a little bit more fun with the with the piece on on, on your on your wrist. It's obviously a square piece, so it's not circular. It's got these interesting um, interesting case. Um, accents on it. When you look at the watch, it also has this cross hash sort of um, design to it. It really was um, something different, something unique, and I think Longines is a great brand, and is a great brand that did this type of thing with many of their pieces, and it set them it set them aside for many others. The last piece that I really enjoyed this year was a 1965 Universal Genève. Reference 166110 Golden Shadow. Universal Genève is a brand that uh, competed heavily um, during its uh, during the, the heyday of watchmaking. Uh, they produced exceptional watches throughout their history, but they also took created watches that really were uh, at the forefront of innovation. One of the things was um, was their caliber 215, which was a new self-winding movement with an oscillating weight integrated into the movement. It's what we call a micro-rotor today. And um, this was obviously something that became extremely popular for, uh, for uh, the brand. It became a huge novel innovation that they came up with and was fitted in one of their most iconic uh, models, the pole router, um, famously designed by Joe Genta. 
many don't know that, but General Genta also created um, the Golden Shadow, uh, a watch that was launched in 1965. Uh, this watch um, was the brand's response to the fiercely competitive ultra-thin wristwatch, and they had a couple different variations. We had a Golden Shadow, which was cased in solid gold. Um, it was so, so incredibly thin um, and used um, and during that time, it was actually the thinnest automatic movement, um, automatic movement watch. Um, that uh, during that time period, it was launched in Basel World, so um, so that was kind of the, the the foray and how it started. It was running on the caliber sixty six, which um, was a record breaking caliber, uh, and uh, was the world's thinnest self winding movement until nineteen seventy eight with a thickness of just 2.3 millimeters. Um, it's incredibly finished, it has that micro rotor which I think is one of the coolest complications you can get in watch collecting, that and an alarm complication. Uh, and honestly wearing this watch on the wrist, it was so it was so thin you didn't notice it, but then you remembered that you had this incredibly designed piece with an incredibly important movement in it. and. When you wear those types of pieces, it doesn't have to be, you know, a fifteen eighteen or something like that. It can be a watch like a like a golden shadow that has a significant place in the history of watchmaking, as well as um, the history of Universal Genève. So those are my four pieces for the year that, that I had the pleasure of covering. As I said, I'll leave a uh, link in the description of this video to all of the articles where we've covered these pieces. If you want to go back and read them. I highly encourage you to do so. We also have videos for each of these pieces. As you probably saw, I was playing some of the um, some of the clips uh, throughout this video, uh, to sort of see, so you could see the watches that we were talking about. So, if you want to see those full videos, there will also be links in the description and on our articles at the bottom of the article. There's a link to the videos if you want to see that. I know that we've spoken a lot about the past, but during this video, but I do think it's important to remember that going into 2024 is a fresh year. Um, many of us need that, uh, many of us m might not need it, might be apprehensive, but what you should look forward to is the fact that there are so many more memories that you can create in 2024, and hopefully watches will be a part of that, and um, it's exciting because there's some unknown to the next year, but what makes that exciting, I think, is um, if you are a watch enthusiast, it's likely going to be filled with watches, and who knows what watches you'll be able to experience during that time. Let me know what your favorite watch was for the last, from the last 20, uh, 12 months. Doesn't have to be vintage. It could be a watch that you wore every single day this year or something that you that got away. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, let me know in the comment section below. If you are new to Life on the Wrist, be sure to subscribe to the channel and share this video with a friend who might be interested in watches. If you wouldn't mind liking this video, it really does help me out. With this said, guys, thank you so much for watching this video, and until next time.